Hi there, it's Alan here. Thank you again for joining us at Arise Online. We hope and we pray that this is a real blessing to you, that uh, it's firing you up in your passion and your faith for Jesus, and it's encouraging you to take that passion and that faith outside the walls of the church. You know, we are blessed to be a blessing, not blessed just to hoard it and keep it to ourselves, but we've been given stuff by God. The idea is that we will take that out there to the world and be a blessing to them. If you're a member of our regular congregation here and you meet physically with us, then you would know that our national cabinet here in Australia have met and there's been an announcement made or it will be made that religious gatherings are going to be increasing in number. Um, What does that mean for us here? Well, keep an eye on our Facebook page. We'll be putting something up uh, first half of next week and letting you know what that physically means for us. There are more than just number issues involved. There's social distancing and so on. So we'll let you know what that means for us in the way forward for us at this stage. Hey, if you're just joining us but you don't physically come here, can I encourage you to continue to join with us? Hey, if you're being blessed by this and you want to find us easier each week, why don't you hit the subscribe button there, the bottom of your screen. Uh, maybe you know some people that might be blessed by some of what's going on here, then hit the share button and flick it across to them. Be a blessing to somebody else uh, that way. And of course, we'd love to continue to pray for you. We've got a prayer team and we'd love to uh, uh, rejoice with the great things that God's doing in your life as well. Build our faith, encourage us by giving us any praise reports. What's God been saying to you? What's he doing in your life? Just feel free to contact us with that email address at the bottom of the screen. Again, maybe you've been watching and you're not a regular church attender or you don't know a whole lot about this Jesus story, but you keep coming back anyway. Hey, why don't you email us and ask us any questions? We'd love to try to uh, answer your questions. Maybe just connect with you and point you in the direction of somebody in your area that might be able to help you understand a little bit more about this crazy Jesus story that the church goes on about. Anyway, without any further ado, why don't we join Daniel and the team in a time of worship, and I'll speak to you on the other side of that. My heart cries 
If you've got a Bible there, could you turn with me to John chapter 12? I want to spend a little bit of time this morning. I want to speak to you out of a passage in the Bible that I believe is one of 
the saddest stories that you'll find in this collection of ancient writings. It's sad because it's a reflection of a bunch of people and where their life was at and where they were prepared to allow their life to go and where they were not prepared to allow their life to go. And not only that, but how their decision to either go there or not go there could have a massive impact on what God wants to do uh, through their life and what God wanted to do in a particular group of people. Uh, before we get there, we've been talking the last few weeks about church. We've been looking at what uh, this movement called The Way is about. And I believe with all my heart that when Jesus said, I'll build my church, that he never intended on just building a religious building. I don't ever believe that he intended to gather a bunch of people together just to perform religious tasks and to talk about religious subjects. I believe he had something else in mind. I uh, was down in Ballinat the other day, half an hour away from where we live on the beach there. And if you go for a walk on the beach or the riverside, and I love to do this, and, and you watch as the tide begins to come on in and you get this water that just kind of gently laps up onto the sand and then it sort of recedes a little bit. But when it pulls back, uh, the dry sand that was there is wet. And, and so then as the tide comes on in, there'll be another little gentle wave and it'll push up upon that dry sand and then it recedes a little bit. But that dry sand, you can see the impact that that water has had upon that dry sand. And it just gradually and slowly moves in and has an impact upon the surroundings. And I believe when Jesus said that he was building his church, I honestly believe that was the picture, something similar to that that Jesus had, that the church would be like a movement, would be like a, the, the, the tide coming in, this gentle rolling in of the water as it laps upon the dry sand and upon the dry ground. And gradually, over time, bit by bit, it would take more and more and more territory. Unfortunately, we look at what church is today, and I don't know that that description necessarily completely fits it. I'm not saying who's to blame. I'm not saying where the problem lies. I'm probably a part of the problem as a pastor of a local church. But I'm wrestling with these issues myself and trying to uh, get back into the Word of God and have a look at how can we get back to being the movement that Jesus envisioned when he spoke in the very beginning and he said, I will build my church. And, and the church I'm building, the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, the, the, the culture, that is around it, the, the evil stuff, the bad stuff that's happening, it's not going to dominate and override and influence the church. In fact, my church is going to influence the culture. My church is going to have influence on the gates of Hades. My church is going to have influence in the communities and the places where I put it as that tide of God's spirit gently rolls in. That, I believe, was the original intention of Jesus. And when I think about that, it stirs a fire in me and it gets me excited again because that's what I want to be a part of. I don't want to be a part of some just religious group of people that gather together and, 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 and get excited behind the walls about God. I want to be a part of a movement of people that are so excited and passionate about God that we have no problem taking that faith outside the walls of the church back into society and back into the community. That's what I believe Jesus wanted and that's what I believe deep down inside of even you as you're watching today, I believe as I share that, you've probably got something bubbling going, you know what, that's what I want too. I don't want to just be a part of a religious group of people. I want to be a part of a movement that's making a difference on planet Earth for Jesus Christ. And I believe that was the intention of Jesus when he said, I'll build my church. And I believe when we read the book of Acts, the first 30 years of the history of the church, that's what we see. We see this movement that is progressing, that's going forward, that's confronting culture, that's confronting the powers of darkness, that's making a difference. We see uh, individuals that are not afraid to stand up for Jesus. They're not afraid to be known, to be associated with Jesus Christ. They're not afraid uh, for people to know that they follow this man, that they follow Jesus, that they believe in the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, even though it makes no logical sense, but they were not afraid to associate themselves with it, even in the face of persecution, in the face of beatings, in the face of being socially discarded. They didn't care. They just had such a passion for God and a heart's desire to glorify him and to let everybody know that, hey, he is real and he exists. And, we, and, and that's the movement that I believe that we were called to. That's the movement. The day you gave your life to Jesus Christ, that's the kingdom. That's the, the, the movement that you were placed into at that particular time. And if you haven't given your life to Jesus, and I want to tell you something, uh, it's an exciting movement to be a part of. Forget religion. Religion is all about man's efforts to try to reach up to God. It's about how can I please God? Man, when you come into the family of God, when you join this movement called the church, it's on the back of understanding fully there is nothing I can do 
to please God. There's nothing I can do to satisfy God. In fact, the Jesus story is not about me trying to reach up to God. It's about God reaching down to me because he knew that I couldn't do it. So forget religion. When I talk to you about the way, when I talk to you about this movement uh, that we're a part of, that, that people today call the church, forget a religious group of people that are just trying to do religious things to impress God or do religious things to make God happy. That is not what Christianity is about whatsoever. If that's what Christianity is about, I don't want to be a part of it either. So I understand maybe why you're sitting on the outside looking in. But that's not what this movement was meant to be. This is not what Jesus envisioned. He saw a movement of people. That would have influence on society, influence for good and not for harm. You know, it's a funny word, that word influence. I was thinking about it um, this morning and I jumped online and I was Googling uh, influence and, you know, what is influence and so on. And it seems that, that, that everything that kept popping up was this thing called social influencers. I don't know if you're aware of this movement called social influencers, people that have uh, Twitter accounts and Instagrams and so on. And uh, they go on there and they amass a whole bunch of followers. And uh, the more followers you get, the more of an influencer that you are in society. I'm not sure what all the behind the scenes metrics are, but I, I've got to be honest with you, I couldn't help but look at, at that list of influences uh, abroad and also here in Australia. And to be honest with you, I thought, I think there's a bit of a difference between being an influencer and just simply being an entertainer. And I looked at some of the pictures and the pages of some of these influences and I thought, and I don't mean to uh, speak out of turn here, but when you've got a, a woman that has done herself up and she's there in a scantily clad bikini and you've got millions of people uh, following you and, uh, and, and watching you. Uh, I don't know whether so much you're influencing them or whether they're just looking at you. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but how much of an influence are you having on them or are they just looking? Or you get the, the guy that's really, really funny and he's just constantly uh, making people laugh and he's got funny clips on there and he's got uh, two million people that are following him because he's really funny and we call him a societal influencer. And, and I look at it and I go, well, I don't know whether you're really influencing uh, people in the way you think you are with the word influence. Certainly you're funny. Maybe you're really just entertaining people, not so much influencing them. And then my mind went to Jesus, who I think has been the most influential human being in the history of mankind. You know, Jesus walked this earth and he had a mass of followers at different points in his earthly journey. But when it got to the very end of that journey, guess what? He didn't have millions and millions of followers. He had a small handful of people that were still kind of hanging on by faith, by their fingernails. And so at the end of his life, what sort of influence did he have? He had a massive influence uh, on, on the world. We'd sit back today and we say Jesus was a massive influencer. But during his lifetime, he had the greatest influence upon a small group of people with whom he did a certain amount of life with. It seems to me that to really influence people in a really long-term effective way, you need to be up close and personal. You can, you can, you can influence from a distance, and I'm not saying you can't. But I think the most influential people that have been in my life and perhaps in your life have been those people that have come alongside of you and have influenced you. You know, sociologists would say that every single one of you out there watching uh, have the capacity to influence people. Sometimes we think of influence, we think you need to be a celebrity, you need to have a high profile in order to be an influencer. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that's true. Sociologists have discovered that the average person will influence about 10,000 people in their lifetime. And what do I mean by that? Well, maybe you're a school teacher and you have left such an incredible impression on a student that that student grows up, goes to university, gets a degree and commits their life to teaching and to educating the next generation because of the influence that you had upon them. They have changed the whole course of their life uh, because of what you have impacted, the way you've impacted them and influenced them. Uh, or influence can be as simple as recommending to your best mate uh, your favourite fish and chip shop and saying you should go there because the fish and chips over there are way better than over here. And so they do. So in that sense, you've influenced that person as well. I don't necessarily think you have to be a big celebrity or have a million followers on Twitter to assert influence. I think every single one of us are called to influence. And when it comes to the church, I think we're called to a specific type of influence. I don't think we're called to gather 10 million followers, people that, that are coming after us. I believe that we're called to influence people towards Jesus. I believe we're called to influence people towards the kingdom of God. I believe we're called to, in our interactions with the world around us, to use that platform that we have as children of God. There's a God-given influence that's upon us, not an influence that we've earned, 
But there's a God-given platform, a God-given influence upon us uh, by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But we need to work with God in order to allow that influence to come out of us and to have an impact on the world around us. You know, I was reading the prodigal son story the other day, and I don't want to get too much into it right now. But it's fascinating that this young man walked away from his father's house and he did everything that he did. But Jesus says when he came home, he went to rehearse his speech and feel like he had to earn his way back. But the father gave him a robe, gave him sandals, gave him a ring. In other words, the authority that that child had in that place, that authority that he had was not something that he earned. It was an inherent authority bestowed upon him by very virtue of the fact that he was a child of the father. And so... As a Christian, you have a certain element, a certain degree of influence in your life here on planet Earth by virtue of the fact that you are born again and that you have a heavenly father. So when you stepped into this family, you were given a certain type of influence. And that type of influence is to be used to point people to the person of Jesus Christ, to point people to the values and the ethics of the kingdom of God. In John chapter 12, we've got a story. And basically, it's a summation of everything uh, all the way up until this point in Jesus' ministry. After this particular passage, starting in, in chapter 13, we see Jesus having the last supper with his disciples. So everything that happens from then on is the last few days of Jesus' life. So John chapter 12, John gives us a summation of everything that's taken place in Jesus' life up until this point. And here's what he says in John chapter 12, verse 42. It says, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Wow, what a sad passage. Read it again. It says that even among the rulers, many believed in him. Even among the rulers. In other words, there were people in position within the religious circle, within the synagogue. There were people of position in this particular organization, group, place that believed in Jesus. They actually believed in Jesus in the same way that you would say you believe in Jesus. These guys believed in Jesus. For all intents and purposes, these guys here are Christians. They're in this group with all the other religious leaders and they believe in Jesus. But then it goes on and it says this, it says, but they did not confess him. They would not confess him. Why? Lest they would be put out of the synagogue. You go back to John chapter 9 and the religious leaders had made a decree, a decision that if anybody was propagating or believing in this Jesus story, that they were going to excommunicate them. They were going to kick them out of the synagogue. Now, these people here, they had faith. It says that they believed in Jesus, but they were afraid of being kicked out of the synagogue. In other words, they had faith, but they were afraid of losing their position in the group. They had faith, they believed, but they didn't want to put that belief out there just in case they lost their position in the group amongst the team with that particular crew. They didn't want to lose the position that they had. These men could have made a massive difference in that particular place where they were. They could have exerted influence amongst that group of people. They had faith. They were given that inherent uh, authority that comes from being a child of the king. They had that upon them and they could have made a difference. They could have asserted influence in that place, but they didn't. Why? Because they were afraid of being excommunicated. They were afraid of being excommunicated. I wonder when I read this story, what could God have done through you had you been more open about what you believed? Had you not been afraid to live life as you believed it to be? And as a believer of Jesus, we have a certain way of living. We have certain things that we, we, we partake of, things that we, we don't. Not, 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 not that because we're better than other people, but because we know what things invest into our, our, our life. We know what things are good for us. We, 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 we worked out some things that just aren't good for us. What could God have done through this group of people? What influence could these people have had on the rest of the group? It's unfortunate, but from what we've read here, it sounds like they had very little or maybe none. Why? Because they didn't want to get kicked out of the group. Hey, doesn't that sound like us a lot of the times? Whether it be in our workplace, whether it be in the community, in our sporting organisations, maybe it's in 
our business. It doesn't matter where it is. There's a group of people in our world that we're close to, that we're maybe friends with and so on. And, and there's that inner battle, isn't there, that takes place at times when you're amongst those people. And something happens and it's a, it's a defining moment. And you've got an opportunity. You don't have to preach at them and say, no, I won't look at that because Jesus... You don't have to preach at them. All you've got to do is make a decision to live a certain way. Maybe a decision to say, no, I don't want to look at those pictures. Thank you. You go right ahead, but it's, it's not what I do. And make a decision to get up and say, look, I don't want to sit here and gossip about that person. Um, you know, if you, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just not comfortable with it. So I'm going to remove myself from that. To say to these people, look, you know, uh, it's my bucks party, but I'm just going to put it out there. Uh, I, I don't go to those places, what you're talking about. I've heard the room, and I'm just not going to do that. And the scenario could be repeated over and over and over and over again. Here's a bunch of people that had belief in Jesus, but they forfeited their influence because they would not confess him. They would not live for him. They would not take a stand for Jesus in the group within which they found themselves. I find that a really, really sad story. They had faith, but they had no influence. I wonder how many believers are out there living like this. You've got faith, but each day when you lay your head down, you know you know that you know that there were moments throughout the day where instead of confessing Jesus through a decision or an action, you know that just like this group of Pharisees, you were afraid of being kicked out of the group, so you just shut down and you kept to yourself. You're afraid of being kicked out of the group, so you just went along with the culture that you found yourself in. You're afraid of being kicked out of the group, and so you just partook in something that deep down inside you knew you shouldn't have partaken of. Hey, this is not about being some weird uh, religious nut who's pushing Jesus on people. I'm not even talking about other people. I'm talking about you and I'm talking about me. Taking a stand for God. You see, I believe that God wants us to have influence, just as Jesus wanted these religious leaders to have influence. But they had faith, but no influence. And it's possible to have faith, but not have any influence. But I don't believe it's the will of God that we have faith and no influence. But these guys had faith with absolutely zero influence. You go down to the very next verse and it tells us why. It says, For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. They love the praise of men more than the praise of God. You see, if we live for the approval and praise of people, then we'll forever be influenced by the culture of around us. We will always be the influenced and we will never be the influencer. We'll always be the one that's buckling and changing and we will never be the one that's bringing about the change that we so desire and so believe needs to take place. You know, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 18, Paul writes this interesting uh, comment. He says this, he says, for it's not he who commends himself who is approved, but the one who the Lord Commends. Let me say it again. It's not the one who commends himself who is approved, but it's the one who the Lord commends. That tells me this. It tells me, one, you can live in such a way that you commend yourself to other people. That's what these leaders and rulers were doing. They were trying to live in such a way that they didn't rock the boat. They were trying to live in such a way that they stayed within the group. Now, the problem with that is that they were the ones that were being influenced and they made themselves null and void of any capacity or opportunity to influence the rest of the group. You can live in such a way that you commend yourself to others. These guys did that. They were motivated by the fear of men. They didn't want to be excommunicated, didn't want to be kicked out. As a result, they could not be used by God to assert any kingdom influence in that particular space. The option is this. Or you can live in such a way that God commends you to others. So you can either live in such a way that you're trying to commend yourself to people. And even if that means compromising your values, even if that means compromising what you believe, even if that means laying down the opportunity to have kingdom influence, even if it means laying down the opportunity to see these people catch a glimpse of heaven down here on earth, you can choose to commend yourself to people. And the people that do that are motivated primarily by the fear of men. We're afraid of being kicked out of the group. Or we can allow God to commend us to people. 
Now, the people who allow God to commend them are those who are more motivated by a fear or a reverential respect for God. We're more concerned about what God thinks of us than we are what the group think of us. We're more concerned about what God thinks of us than we are what other people think about us. And so we make a decision that we're going to live uh, by the values of God, the values of the kingdom. We make a decision that we're going to live by the ethics of God. We, we've made that decision in our life that we are going to journey towards God, discover more about him. And as we discover more about God, and how he wants us to live, we're going to put action to that and we're going to live that way. And when we do that, Paul, uh, Paul says this. He says, if you're that kind of a person, then you're positioning yourself in a place where God can come along and God can begin to commend you to other people. How do you want to do it? Do you want to continue to try to commend yourself to others, which means compromising on your own values and stance? Or do you want to be the kind of person that God recommends? That when God sees something out there and he sees the heart of a person and they're going through a struggle and a trial and a difficulty, do you want to be the person that the Spirit of God taps them and goes, I want you to talk to that person over here. I'm recommending this person over here. You know why I can recommend that person? Because they're not worried about what everybody else thinks. They're not going to compromise and they're not going to just try to make you like them. What they're going to do is they're going to give you truth because they're a person of integrity. They're a person of honor. They're a person that lives out the kingdom values. So I'm going to commend you to this person. I would rather be living a life where I'm getting the commendation of God than the commendation of people. I would rather be living a life true to the values of the kingdom of God, putting myself in a position where I can be the one that God uses to bring about change on planet Earth, then consistently be the ones who are bowing to the culture around us, consistently bowing to everybody else's values to the exclusion of God's. Why? Because we're just simply afraid of standing out a little bit. We're afraid that we might lose our social status. We're afraid that they might stop talking to me in the lunchroom. We're afraid of all these types of things. And you know what? I don't want to say that those fears are not valid. I don't want to say uh, there's something wrong with you because you feel that way. I don't believe that there is. But I'm saying this, that at some point in our journey, our faith has to impact us to a point where it can start to impact others through us. You see, the faith of these particular rulers here, I look at that story and I think, well, I wonder how much your faith had impacted you. Because you see, I believe this, my faith has to impact me first. If my faith can't impact me, then my faith won't impact others. Let me say it again. If I don't allow my faith to impact my life, then how is my faith going to impact the lives of other people? You see, the first port of call for being a person who exudes kingdom influence is to be able to allow the faith that I have to permeate my life in such a way that I no longer live for the praise of men, but I live now for the praise and the glory of God. I don't live for men to pat me on the back and tell me how wonderful and how awesome I am. I live for that small whisper from heaven where God leans in and says to me, hey, you're my beloved son too. And guess what I want to say to you? I'm well pleased with you. That's the kind of life that I want to live and I believe that's the kind of life that you want to live. You know, I actually wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for a person doing that. There was a young man by the name of Alan Blanche many years ago. I moved to a little town called Ballin in the north coast of New South Wales. I was not a believer, didn't come from a Christian background, had no God stuff going on there at all. The first guy I met when I moved down, he was a guy called Alan Blanche. He was younger than me. He was about a year younger than me. And, and I met this guy the first, uh, pretty much the first day that I arrived uh, down here in Ballin. And there was something different about this guy. We went to the same high school. Uh, but he just didn't seem to get as flustered about things the way I did. He didn't get involved in the backbiting and the slander like a lot of other people that I knew did, and maybe I did at that point as well. He didn't have that vindictiveness about him. He didn't want to pay somebody back wrong for wrong uh, like maybe I did and a lot of the other people around me. And yet, even though he didn't want to go with the flow of the culture, there was a strength about that young man and there was a peace about his heart. And you know what? It was a number of years later on down the track when I finally bowed my knee completely to Jesus at age 19. But I can tell you this. I can trace that back to a young man who went against the grain, a young man who was not afraid to confess Jesus amongst a group of people who obviously didn't believe the same stuff and didn't think the same way. He wasn't afraid to stand out. It was nothing that Alan Blanche said to me. It was nothing that he spoke to me. There were no words he gave me that got me across that line and got me to a place of salvation. But it was the life that he lived before me was the thing that opened me up to be able to hear the words. You see, I had to see faith inside of a person first before I could hear the message of faith. 
I had to see that faith works. And Alan Blanch was a young man who influenced my life in such a way, not by what he said, but simply by the way that he lived his life. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Alan, if it wasn't for a young man who was not ashamed to stand up and to confess before men what he believed. You see, Alan had influence on me. Alan had influence on me. You see, when people are ready for something different, they go looking for different people. And I believe that with all my heart. When people get to a point in their life where they're ready for something different, then they go looking for different people. And if you're somebody who has faith, but because of the fear of men, you've never allowed yourself to step across that mark, and you've just gone with the flow and gone along with the rest of the crowd, then guess what happens when somebody in that crowd wants something different and they go looking for someone different, guess who they don't find? They don't find you. Because you're just like everybody else. What's happened? Well, basically, you've laid down your kingdom influence. You've laid down your kingdom influence. Now, God wants us to take up our kingdom influence. God wants us to make a difference in the world in which we live. He wants us to make a difference in our families. He wants us to make a difference in the workplace. He wants us to make a difference in government. He wants us to make a difference in the business world. He wants us to make a difference in the supermarkets and in the marketplaces. He wants us to make a difference. But when people are looking for something different, they'll be looking for a person that's different. The question you've got to ask yourself is this. I have faith. But am I ashamed? Do I confess Jesus before people? Am I motivated by the fear of man or am I motivated by my love for God? Am I more concerned about getting the praise of people or am I concerned about the praise of God? You see, I think this is a good question for everybody that calls himself a Christian because God wants to change the world through you, but he can't change the world through you if you hide from the world who you really are. So you're called to be an influencer for God in this generation. But you'll never fully experience who you could be for God if you're worried about who you should be for man. What decisions are you going to make? Are you going to stand for Jesus? Are you going to be one of those people that are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you going to be somebody that is going to confess Jesus before men? And by confess, I don't mean opening your mouth every time you speak and telling someone the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. I'm talking about living for Jesus, giving them something to look at, giving them a picture of what I mean by the message that I preach. Do you want to be that kind of person today? I do, because I believe they're the kinds of people that God uses to build his kingdom here on earth. God bless you guys.